Our second testament lesson comes from 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lo and is in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of many hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The word of the Lord. A few weeks ago, I talked with you about how important it is for us to examine our theology, especially as it plays out in our daily lives in practical ways. My example at that time was how seeing someone as a sinner, born to be a sinner, or someone made very good, will change how we interact with people depending on who we believe they are at their core. As I was studying the scripture this week for today, I realized that this time 
I was going to have to be a little bit more vulnerable and talk about a way that a seemingly unconsequential belief caused serious damage in my life. Because this week we are talking about the gifts of God. And for the majority of my life, my understanding of God's gifts and how they worked caused me to feel unworthy. Now, I want to be clear that this toxic belief was not given to me on purpose. It wasn't meant to be hurtful. In fact, on the surface, everything that I was taught was very well intended and looked to be uplifting theology. The only way that I learned that what I believed was harmful is by the fruits it produced in my life. When it became apparent that the fruits that these beliefs were producing were rotten, I had no other choice but to re-examine what I understood to be God's gifts. God's gifts were always presented to me as the good things in life, which is truthful enough, however, when this idea that all good things come from God matches with another common Christian teaching, they turn toxic. Because I did not just believe that God's gifts were good, I also believed I was unworthy of them. And so the equation that developed in my mind was God equals good and bad equals me and what I deserved. This is not what was taught to me, but what had found root inside of me was this equation that that I was supposed to strive to be perfect like Jesus. That was my assignment. But that I could never hope to achieve any sort of good grade because I was a miserable sinner. We can begin to see how these theologies play off of each other and start rotting us from the inside. I tried to be good. I knew what my assignment, what my role in this world was. I was the good student. I was the good child. I was the good friend. But when I found myself in a relationship with another person, I started valuing being the good girlfriend over everything else. And eventually it became apparent that this was not a healthy way to live. Because I believed good things came from God, but that I deserved bad things. So when my partner dealt me bad things, that fit with my view of myself. It's what I deserved. And my job was to be the good girlfriend despite it all. The occasions that good things happened was a blessed relief from God. I gave God all the credit for those moments, for the light shining. And when bad things happened, it was just par for the course. What else could I expect to happen to me? My theology justified the abuse. And so for four years, I tried to make these pieces fit together, that God is good and I have good gifts, but I deserve bad things, and so bad things are going to happen, and my job is to push through and persevere and be like Jesus. Until one day, the Spirit took hold of me and refused to meet with that person again. That spirit of God that overtook me, that possessed me, told him to forget my number, to forget that I exist. That we wanted nothing more to do with him. That's exactly how I told that story of that moment when I broke free, that it was the spirit that saved me. And we can hear that toxic theology even working in that moment. The moment that I broke free, I couldn't give myself any credit 
for any of the good things that were happening. I couldn't give myself credit that I had finally stood up for myself. That must have been all God, because only good things come from God. I am bad. This is how strong our beliefs can dictate our lives. They can literally write our story for us. That all the good things are from God, and we are poor, miserable sinners. When I read this story about Moses this week, I heard that same toxic theology start to come up and inform how I was reading what was happening. Here is poor, miserable Moses, a runaway murderer who stutters, who can't get anything right, and God steps in and in God's grace gives Moses all he needs to be a good leader. Moses does not deserve the position or the attention, yet God has mercy and gives him good gifts and good signs. This is how I've always read this story until last week. Till I finally made the connection that that same toxic theology that nearly destroyed my life was trying to inform me on what was happening in these scriptures to Moses. And I had to step back, tear off that lens, and reread what was happening to try and find why was Moses chosen? Why were these the signs that were given to him? Because God could have stepped in and just made a wonderful sign in the sky. If people started disbelieving Moses, God could have shown up and said something amazing. There's lots of things that God could have done, but these signs are given for a reason. The first sign When Moses starts to get worried that they might not listen to me, God looks at him and says, what have you already got? What's that in your hand? And Moses has his shepherding staff. And he says, it's it's just my staff. I use it for different things in the flock. If there's a dangerous ledge, I can stand next to the ledge and keep my flock on the safe ground. If there's a fight, I can reach over and break it up. If there's a predator, I can make myself look very big and scare the danger away. But it's just my shepherding staff. And God thinks, wow, you've really learned how to use that well. What else do we have? There must be other dangers that you've learned to conquer in that flock. And Moses thinks, like, well, there's, there's snakes around, and I've learned I can pick them up by the tail and flick them away and they can't get me. And God says, yes, these are skills that I can use. So God says, if they begin to doubt you, throw your staff on the ground and it will turn into a snake. And then pick it up by its tail and it will turn back into your shepherding staff. This is things that Moses already felt comfortable doing, and so Moses is happy to perform this miracle with God. The next sign shows that God does not just know who Moses is as far as his skill levels, the things that he can perform for God, but God knows who Moses is on the inside. God knows that Moses will be the kind of leader he already is, the kind of leader that puts his body in the way of danger. When Moses saw a slave being beaten, he put his body in way to stop that danger, to the point of killing the abuser. Moses was not hesitant to protect himself, but knew what was right. And so God says, I I know who you are on the inside, and you're willing to put your very flesh on the line for what you believe in. And so reach into your coat, and when you remove your hand, it will be leprous, leprous. Then when you put your hand back into your coat and reveal it again, it will be healthy. And the people will know that you are the kind of leader willing to put your very flesh on the line for them and for their protection. 
since this is so rooted in who Moses already is, Moses says, okay, I can do that. And then the last sign. The last sign is a bit different. It involves asking them to bring water to Moses, so it's not something that Moses already has on his person. This is actually a move we see modern-day magicians making. I might show you a couple tricks with my cards or my cups, but the skeptics among you would think, oh, those are special cards and special cups. And so an illusionist might ask someone to give them a $20 bill. It's something we're all familiar with. It's what we hold value in. And it is not something that the illusionist brings. It is of the community. So God says, ask them to bring you some water. And the water in the Nile is well known within the community. It is where they wash, where they play. It is literally the lifeblood of their community to nourish them and to keep them well. And in all those years, all the generations that have interacted with this water of the Nile, never have they seen it turn into blood. And so for Moses to take their most valuable asset, something that they know so well, and cause it to do something they have never experienced before, would convince the best skeptic among them that this was a leader with power and worthy of following. That this leader could take a thing that we know so well and change it into something different. This final sign connects all that Moses is as a leader to the people, to the things that they value the most. That in his hands, new things can happen in their lives. These signs are gifts from God to Moses. And they're meant to help him as he takes on this role of the leader of God's chosen people. And it is true that these are good gifts, but that's not the whole truth. Because by Moses being willing to perform them and to work with God, they are also Moses' gifts back to God. Moses had learned how to use the staff, learned how to handle the snake. He was already the kind of leader that would put his body on the line for what was right. These are things that were already existent inside Moses before he was chosen to be a leader. And so God takes those things that are so core, so natural to Moses, lifts them up, and makes them the signs that people will believe. It would be absolutely correct for Moses to claim that these are all God's signs, but they are also also deeply rooted in who Moses is, what he's skilled at, who he is on the inside, his core nature. These are good gifts from God, and Moses is a very active and willing partner in the process of making this great good, this releasing of God's people from Egypt. It is a great work of God, and it is a great work of Moses. Our Second Testament reading encourages us to fan the flame of God's gifts which shows us that the gifts that God gives us are just sparks and that they will remain simply sparks unless we will fan the flame and turn it in to something that we can put on a torch and lead God's people into the next era. That we must be good stewards of the gifts that we are given as well so that in our hands we become what God needs us to be. When I gave God all the credit for rescuing me from a bad relationship, it left me with deep distrust in myself. I had chosen the bad person. I was not able to get out. 
So I might choose again, and what if God is not there to rescue me? It wasn't until I accepted my role in making that final call that I began to trust myself again. That it was the strength that I had built inside me that allowed me to break free. Was God there cheering me on, reminding me of my strength? Of course. But that strength was mine. It was my voice that spoke up. And that power that took control of me is mine. So I want you to take time this week to give yourself credit for how far you have gotten. The things that you have overcome, the things that you have faced, the times that you have pushed forward. God was there helping, gifting good gifts, but you were also an active participant in the good that God was doing. It is a partnership between you and God that got you here. You are not unworthy. You are the very tool that God needs to make this world what it is becoming. Give yourself credit for being the willing and active partner with God for the betterment of this world. You are worthy of it. You are worthy. 